Father, we want to continue to give you thanks, Lord, to praise you this evening. Lord, to take that which you have given us and you've made known to us, Lord, which is at least a partial understanding of our salvation, Father, to, to honor you, Lord, by doing the things you've told us in faith, to present them to you, to trust you, and ask you, Lord, that you would make everything of it, our salvation, our relationship, of us, Lord, your children, your sheep, your sons and daughters, your property. You show us so much, Lord, that which you've created, that which you've redeemed, Father, that you would just take us and make us all that you desire us to be. And you've shown us, Lord, what that is, that you are making us, transforming us, conforming us to the image of your Son. Father, help us to please you and honor you by just sitting at your feet and hearing what your spirit would say. And after, Lord, we have heard and your spirit has enabled us to understand. Lord, to honor you by trusting you in faith as we look to you and you bear your fruit. All that you desire, Father, your complete will to be done in the portion that you've set out for this evening. We ask you, thanking you in faith, Father, for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, heard a couple amen, so we've got some agreement. Hey, so let me start out with uh, the question that was asked last Wednesday, the application question. And as I remember it, it was this. Is your relationship with the Lord everything that he desires it to be? No one's volunteered any information on that, and there wasn't a requirement, but I think it gives an opportunity to ask, how would you know? Who would you ask? The person sitting to your left or to your right? No, you would ask the one whose opinion will ultimately matter, the only one who knows, and that's the Lord. And in truth, we know that, well, when we look to him, when we're trusting him in faith well at that moment it is and when we're not it isn't and this process of walking in the lord that of what we call christian growth is that of becoming well more pleasing to him more like him in that very thing and i believe that that is certainly an aspect to what the lord had in mind when he moved our brother his apostle uh, John to write the letter that we looked at first John as it was really a continuation of many themes that we saw in the gospel of John tonight I am convinced brothers and sisters prayerfully that we are spending our time in second John because the Lord has so directed as we sit in this season of finishing up these foundational truths truths that are going to be absolutely essential that we will have yet this one more evening to look back on a few things and to take with us a few new things, even as Jesus taught in the Gospel of Matthew, the 13th chapter, that everyone who is perfectly trained in law will be like a scribe who brings out treasures, new things, and old things. So I think that is the opportunity before us this evening as we ponder that question with the opportunity to grow, well, confident in the realization that tonight, well, we can have more of our relationship like exactly that which the Lord would have it to be. So 2 John is an interesting book because, you know, God wrote it. It's the Bible. Of course it's an interesting book. More than that, we have things attributed to it, namely the title, authorship, that we don't find in the letter. We understand that this is an actual historical letter written to the church, brothers and sisters, nearly two millennia ago, but it has at least a dual purpose. Instructions teaching for them, but also instructions and in teaching second purpose for the church at all times, in all ages, of which we are apart. So as we look at this historical document, we remember that it's as fresh today and as applicable today as it was then.
But in that also, we realize that it's only by the Spirit of God that we're going to understand this. So this interesting letter, I said, is, well, it's known that it was written by John to the church, but it doesn't say that within the letter. It starts out, if you had the opportunity to read in, well, speaking in code, if you will, Bible code, let's look at this as we look at the letter and then start to discover the teaching that the Lord had for them, our brothers and sisters so long ago, the same teaching that he has for us this evening. Second John opens in verse 1 where we read, the elder to the elect lady and her children. There's the Bible code. He doesn't come out and say, John to the church and all those who are in it, but that's exactly what he means in metaphor. We suppose many things why John wrote this letter. Uh, and the common one, which seems to fit, and I have to use the word seems because we need to be careful. If it doesn't say so in the text, we can't be absolutely sure unless, well, the Lord shows us. But we know that at this point of time when we believe this letter was written, probably late in the Apostle John's life, it is thought that uh, 1 John and Revelation were written very late uh, in both the 90s of you know, 90 AD, first century, and a time when which the Apostle John would have been closing in on 90 himself if he wasn't 90 years old. So an old man who has been serving the Lord, round numbers, round decades for some 60 years, if you put Jesus ascending in the early 30s AD. So this is an interesting perspective, and certainly as John was an, an apostle, he was also an elder or a leader in the church, but we know historically, as the decades wore on, that the Christian faith met with opposition. The church was persecuted. It didn't stop the church. Hey, hang on to that for some things we're going to see at the very end of this uh, rather numerically short teaching, but rather profound teaching. The method might have changed a little bit to exercise prudence and wisdom, to not needlessly expose anyone to harm, but the church was not stopped, even in the face of opposition. So it is thought, and personally I think it is true, that John wrote in, in code, so no one would be directly named, so no one, if the letter was intercepted or found out as it was copied and no doubt distributed, that these Christians would be needlessly persecuted. But the church knows in the same way that you and I would know as we pray and read, it's like, no, John had to have written this. Man, it's the same as First John. The themes are carried on, and those themes are the same as the gospel of John. So no doubt our brother, the apostle John, wrote this to the elect lady. Well, it's not super secret code. You know, the church is often referred to metaphorically as a lady, as she, the bride, of Christ, elect, of course, chosen in the Lord, and her children, those who are born into uh, the church. So it fits. So John's writing to the church without naming them. And then he says, once that's established, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also who know the truth. So maybe a helpful question, we can kind of pick out our applications as we move through that. Is that me? Is that you? Is that us? I mean, do we love the church? Well, I, I love Jesus. I love God. I love the Holy Spirit. I, you know, some of my brothers and sisters I kind of like, but no, more than that, the, the whole body of Christ and everyone, I'll, I'll give you a pass. Everyone's going to say, of course we do. God says to. Right? But even more than that, and certainly the Lord does say, and that commandment's going to be referenced, uh, the commandment which we've had from the beginning to love one another. Does the Lord give us a reason to actually love, appreciate, to, to give selflessly or sacrificially that kind of love to, well, to an organization? supernatural or not. And a lot of people love a lot of organizations and give selflessly or sacrificially, but when we look at 
the bride of Christ, the body of Christ, the church, the assembly of called out ones. That's really what the church is, right? Think of, and there, there's not a right or a wrong answer to this, but I think if you have a ready reference in your mind, it's going to help you. It's going to set a context or a framework this evening. So in that, I would say, hey, what's one good reason What's one ready reason why it would make sense to love the church? And I think there's obviously more than one. Hey, I, Jesus obviously loves the church and gave herself for her, so that's it. But how about even more practically, and I'm not sure that that's accurate enough. Well, there's a lot of things. Let's look at this from maybe a secular perspective. If a person was going to pick a pursuit or a time or an organization to put all their time, their effort, and their energies into. And certainly they'd want to they'd want to put their time into something where they got pleasure and enjoyment from that. And <clears throat> hopefully that that is a, well, it's a reality for those in the church. But more than that, from a secular perspective, what would you counsel someone to stake everything into? And this isn't such a hypothetical statement when you think about it. We counsel young people, if we're parents, our children, others all the time with good intentions and our best understanding of this is a good path, pursue it. Hey, if it comes into investing your future, if you're advising your child, you want to go into something that's going to, well, maybe several things, something that'll make a difference, something that'll provide for their child. How about something that'll last? Would you encourage your child to undertake a career in VCR repair at this point in history? No, why not? Because most children don't even know what a VCR is at this point. It didn't hang around. And so we look at not most things of the world, but biblically speaking, everything in the world. Remember what we're told in First John, don't love the things of the world, right? Because the world and the form of it are passing away. It's a continuation. But here we're just not told to love the church. We're just told that they do love the church. But in that, I see, well, one of the reasons God has given us, Jesus has said of the church and the church uniquely, the church alone, that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Think about living in such a time when you are so potentially persecuted that any communication you have with one another, you have to well, conceal your identities for the sake of prudence and safety and not endangering someone. Those were real days, and those are real days that are coming again. Where would you go? Where would you seek safety? The Lord. But specifically, it's the church. It's the assembly. It's when people get together in his name that we meet with Jesus. That is a reason practically to love the church. And I want to point something else out to you that we kind of concluded with in our last couple of studies. When we look at this first verse, where again, John writes the elder to the elect lady, the church and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also who know the truth. Now that word is the experiential aspect. Now, it's a carryover from 1 John because remember the last couple of studies as we introduced early that word knowing that it was in the letter a lot. But then as we got to the last portions, we saw the Lord change things up a little bit when he changed the form of the word, the use of the word know. And you might not remember the, the Greek variants, one is from a, a variation of gnosis, to know experientially, and one is from the Greek word ido, to know cognitively or intellectually, to know in our head, but not know in our experience. And just a, hopefully a helpful illustration uh, to illustrate the difference would be like this. Hey, do you know what it's like to live in Denmark? Well, there'd be two ways. You might say, yeah, you know what? I read a book about it. Now we'd say, I watched YouTube or something probably, but I read a book, I studied up, so I know. That kind of know would be, I know I do, intellectually, I know cognitively. But then someone would say, yeah, I spent two years there, I know, well, 
gnosis, experientially what it's like. So this word is someone who has, as the Lord has taught us, as a major theme going forward, we first know intellectually, we first learn to hear of the word, so we know experientially. This one has been told of people who have gone through the process. They've done the Bible studies, they've prayed, they've reasoned it out, and now, well, they're living it. They're experiencing it. It's not just something, I, oh, I love the church because I know it's the right answer, but I've seen what the Lord has said, I've trusted him by faith, I've yielded to his spirit, and it's, well, it's actually his love through me, and now I know that. It's a, a part of my life. So when John says, not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us, and, this is excellent, will be with us forever. Now, tonight I'm reading from the ESV more on that Sunday, and you might find a couple of words I'll point out differently. I think it gives us an opportunity to see a little more fully, but I want to point something out to you for your careful understanding. Why? Because we just talked about the process. First you have to understand it in our brains and then after we've heard the word we come to trust it and then it becomes a, a reality, an experience in your life. And what we need to understand, what the Lord tells us is because of the truth that abides in us, abides, remains, doesn't come, doesn't go, and there's a couple ways to think about that, we are told that the Holy Spirit abides in us, right? He will be with us forever, okay? And we are sealed with him, and he is the spirit of truth. So that is a way. And if we think about his word, and this one can be, well, we have a part to play in it. Jesus said, if we abide in his word, we shall know the truth, and the truth will make us free. So it can be that way as well that the truth abides. And it's actually both that the Lord is working towards. But the Lord says this experience has something to do, verse 2, because of the truth that abides or remains in us, now here it is, will be with us forever. I want you to just take a moment here and we'll jump back to that rather long explanation, the church and why do we love the church well, Jesus is building the church. The church is not going to fail. The church is, is sure ground. We understand that, and the Lord has committed himself to that. That commitment is made known to us in this phrase. The truth that abides in us will be with us forever. I want you to just think for a moment of a couple of the promises that the Lord says uh, to us in his word. He has begun a good work in us is faithful to complete it until the day of Christ. He will never leave us or forsake us. No one will snatch us out of the Father's hand. And again, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. We see the Lord's commitment to this, and I want you to notice this very clearly. John is writing from a perspective of something like 60 years of seeing the Lord face to face, walking with him in the flesh, seeing the revelations, ministering to his church, seeing the church at its purest, right? And seeing more of the process, I believe, than any of us have currently seen. And one of the pillars, one of the foundations, he says, is the faithfulness of God displayed in his word, okay? Just, it's a necessary foundation. John doesn't make that much of it in the word, but we're building up to something here. Verse three, we're told that the truth that abides in us will be with us forever, and then in verse three, grace, mercy, and peace will be with us. Now, I encourage you guys to drill down on that in your word study to look at the, the prepositions, and every good translation will translate it that way because that's what it means. It will be with us. No matter what it feels like, no matter what it seems like, the Lord is working out his purpose. Strong consolation here from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. I would just suggest to you that you cannot separate those two. The world does. The world will offer up 
um, professions of love that are not based on truth. I had to lie to him. I had to lie to her because I love them and I wanted to shield them from... No, the Lord simply doesn't do that. We'll see that developed a little bit more as we really get into some, well, some heavy new ground or maybe a new and fuller perspective on an older position in verse 4. The Lord says through his apostle to the church in 2 John, verse 4, I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. Did you see it? Wait a minute. I rejoiced greatly to see some of your children? Well, there's a very strong implication there that we get to in a moment, but wouldn't it be more accurate to say, I rejoice greatly to see all of your children. And all of your children are saying, everybody in this church, and maybe this was one specific local church, and no doubt the letter spread to others, but it seems addressed to a local congregation. And he says, well, in his experience, in his understanding, I rejoice greatly to find some. Well, what's the implication? The implication is, not all of them were. Well, before we get to that, it's like, what does it mean to walk in the truth? If we go back to 1 John, and I would just like to uh, put out there for your testing, that in Scripture, light and truth are often synonymous. Do you remember way, way back, 1 John chapter 1, where we're told, if we walk in the light, as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another. Hmm, okay. So there's something about our fellowship with the Lord, walking in the light or walking in truth. So I'm just going to suggest, well, if we walk in the light as he walks in the light, we're also told in 1 John, that there's somebody in that fellowship that wasn't at that time doing that. I'm going to use a key word, yet, that I'll get to in a moment. Now, all of these things encourage us to just really focus and seek the Lord. Why would the Lord say through a servant, I'm rejoicing to find some of you walking in the truth, when to our natural way of thinking, now I'm only going to rejoice if everybody's there. Can I just suggest to you that the Lord is so not like us in so many ways? That's why he's moving us to be more like him. If we're willing to trust the truth that the Lord says, we see a lot of ways clearly given. Is there anything in Scripture where the Lord says, I will rejoice when every last person on the earth comes to salvation? No. No, actually we know that that's not going to happen. Most aren't going to. And we know that the Lord is not thrilled about people rejecting the free offer of salvation. We know the Lord grieves, the Lord sorrows. He desires that none should perish, but all come to repentance. But what else do we know? We know, according to the Lord, that there's more joy in heaven over 487.6 million sinners who repent. One sinner than 100 righteous people. The Lord's numerology, his math, is just kind of different than ours. How about 2 Chronicles 16.9? How many people is the Lord looking for to strengthen on his behalf? The eyes of the Lord rove to and fro throughout the whole earth looking for one. One. What is the biblical example given to us as a, well, a person of faith? the father of the faithful, Abraham, one guy the Lord calls out to raise up a nation for himself, the nation of Israel. And of course, he again becomes the father of the faithful for the church. So one, so we can look at a lot of other verses. Jesus told the disciples when they asked him point blank, Lord, are there few who are saved? And Jesus, in essence, answers, yes, that's the case. You strive to enter by the narrow gate. Many are not going to be. Right? 
be of good cheer, little flock. The Lord rejoices over anyone who comes to him. We often say, and it's, it's not the case in numbers, but I think it's true in concept, that if there were only one that was going to come to the Lord, that Jesus would have came and died for that one. And we know in our personal experience that it's, it's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, event for us. Now, that's part of it, okay? That's just us aligning ourselves with what the Lord says. Let's make an application. Uh, it's, it's really hard for me, maybe hypothetical. Have you ever, have you ever turned out on a, a Bible study? Let's make it really hard to grasp. Like maybe it's some cold and dark wintry night when you weren't really feeling like it. You thought, you know, I don't really want to, maybe I'm not feeling like going, but by faith I know I'll go and I'll get there and I'll probably, it's going to be better when I get there. That's always how the Lord works. You get there and maybe the pace, place isn't packed, right? And you look around and you, well, are you more affected by the people who aren't there than rejoicing in the people who are there? It's a question of perspective. Oh, I'm bummed out because so-and-so wasn't here or so-and-so was there. What about, was there one other person who was there or a couple other people? Now, there's even more than that. Part of this, again, is just challenging our thinking and aligning it with the Lord's. But the extension of what the Lord is revealing happens when we think back to 1 John chapter 2. Remember when the Spirit of God through John wrote to the church, I write to you fathers, I write to you young men, I write to you little children. If you don't remember that, you can go back and look at the teaching on chapter 2, but we see a strong reference to a biblical fact. The Lord grows his people at different rates. Brothers and sisters, if you're the kind of sister or brother who would show up whether you feel like it or not because you know the Lord's directing and you're just trusting in that and you know be there a lot of people or there's not a lot of people this is a concept that should encourage you you are one of the people that the Lord is focusing on first not only but first and I believe what the Spirit of God is saying through John is I rejoice and if you're writing to an individual church that there are some in that church who are walking in the truth. Why? Because that is evidence of the Lord at work. That is evidence that the gates of hell have not prevailed. We have a tendency to think, oh no, if we're not all working, there's problems. Like, no, there must be. Remember what the Lord has said to us? Well, in part, I hear that there are divisions amongst you, the church in Corinth, but there has to be, 1 Corinthians 11, so that those who are approved may be recognized. Let me ask you in more practical terms. If you, as a child of God, understand by God's grace and the word of God, what God is doing, his purpose in the church is to, well, it's to bring you to maturity, to make you like him, so that he has a place to dwell with you there, and it's his life through you, partnership of that. If, if you understand what he is doing, and that part of his transformation process is to take you through the same work. You know, a servant is not greater than his master. It's enough that you be like him. The things that Jesus did are going to be examples. If I then, your Lord and master, so washed your feet, you ought to wash others' feet. I did not come to be served, but to serve. You put all these things together and you understand that Jesus gives an example. He sets a pattern so that we might walk in his steps. That's clearly his word as written um, through his apostle Peter. Okay, he's doing these things to develop us, to make us like him. I hope that's a given in a short review. For you people that are joining online, joining here tonight, I think it is, especially as you've been with us this year. That's what the Lord's doing. So let me ask you a question. Would it be possible in the church, the one place where he works to accomplish this, to develop you if there weren't people to minister to? There has to be both sides of this. There are those who are 
ministered to by the Lord. They are matured at a rapid, well, a pace of the Lord's choosing before others. Rapid was really not a, a right word to use. In order that the Lord would continue his work in them as he uses them to minister to others who will then also come to that position. And the process repeats, reproducing disciple makers, if you will. So I believe that what the Lord is writing to us, I rejoice to see that happening. Hey, there's some there because that group will be faced with circumstances. That group is yielded. That group the Lord will use and the Lord will not fail as he ministers to others also here. So let's look at that again in verse four. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth just as we were commanded by the Father. Now, we're gonna get more specific with the commands, but don't lose that some. And it really, I think, causes uh, an opportunity or creates an opportunity for us to evaluate much of the teaching that we hear outside of the word of God, outside of what the spirit of God that we might find in the worldly church. And by the way, I would say the Lord didn't say that the gates of hell would not prevail against anything but his church. And that's what we're reading about because that's what this was written to. His church, the elect lady and her children. Just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, and imagine this if you were in this church. I mean, you're sitting there and times are clearly tough or it wouldn't have been written with coded names here. So you're probably, if you're one of these people walking in the truth, you're probably the people who risked persecution of a very real type to turn out to hear what God has said to you in this letter. And now, now it here it is clear. I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one which we've had from the beginning, that we love one another. Very clearly, all the way back to the Gospel of John, recorded 13th chapter, Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And we learn as we pray and walk in faith, and the Lord teaches us both intellectually and experientially as he does his work in us, what that love looks like. And in a word, it looks like Jesus the way that he loved others. And that's what he said, that you love one another as he has loved us. So here's one of, one of those brothers or sisters we might imagine at a very dark time in the church, at least in the world, a very dangerous time turning out. And what is the Lord saying? Well, it's the same plan. Now, there's a specific command, but let's broaden that. We know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We know it's said of the Father, I am the Lord, I change not. That's one of the characteristics of God. Immutability means he cannot change. So what we can also helpfully understand is whatever the Lord's plan from the beginning, what was written two millennia ago, is the same thing for the church tonight. The command that we've had from the beginning, that we love one another, verse 6, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you've heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. Well, is it love? Well, yes, but it's everything that the Lord has said. Right? What, what is the, what do you, just believe when Jesus was asked, what must we do to do the works of God? This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he has sent. It doesn't change from that. It expands as the Lord teaches us more. He teaches us more of what to believe and it's bound up in his love for us, his love through us to others expressed. But even that's not going to happen unless you believe him, as we studied in Romans, right? 
that the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. It's not from our own resources that we're commanded to do anything, for Jesus has said, apart from me, you can do nothing. It's just by trusting in the Lord, and when he says love and he adds to that, it's like, it's my love, love like I loved you, my love has been poured out. It's just yielding to the Lord as he ministers through us. And that'll never change. So important to grab onto that for some reasons we're going to see. Because even at that early time, there is much, there was much happening as there is in this later time. Verse 7, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now, again, that was mentioned in 1 John. We know false teachers have been a problem. People who started out with the church, didn't remain with the church, went out from the church. John wrote previously, they went out from us because they were not of us. Teaching all manner of things that are contrary to what we're going to see here in a few verses as the teaching or the doctrine of Christ. It comes down to that. Of all the things you're going to hear, it simply comes down to this. Hey, is this what God has said? Because if not, well, it's not of God. Let's look at this in a little more detail. Again, verse 7. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. One of the early deceptions that the church was faced with, that Jesus wasn't physically there in the flesh. And you can imagine some 60 years in that there would have been generations of people that have now been born and grown up and been born into the church that were not alive when Jesus walked the earth, when he cruci was crucified, buried, rose again, and ascended. Now they have just the testimony of people that were there. John is one, and, well, when you don't have facts, that's an opportunity, or when you don't have the physical experience, it's an opportunity for these deceivers to work. Satan will take advantage of it. Satan was working hard even when Jesus was there in the flesh. So one of the, one of the deceptions was, well, you know, Jesus never really wasn't God in the flesh. There was another guy, but he wasn't God, and there's variations of that that still exist today. Now, What's been told of this particular deception, the way that we deal with it is true of all deceptions. And it begins with this, verse 8. Watch yourselves. Okay, There's a comma there in this translation, so I'm going to hold there. We do watch out for one another. We are, in a sense, our brothers, our sisters, keepers. We're part of one another. But if I could use an analogy that would make absolutely no sense to John and his audience of those days, I think of, for those of us who have traveled on an airplane or, or have seen this so many times in some form of media, right? When they're teaching you about there's problems in flight and something has happened and the, the oxygen masks drop down and there you are, you're traveling with somebody else or you're traveling with children or maybe an aged relative and your first response is to, well, to help them because they might not be able to get their oxygen mask. Contrary to what we think is selfless action, those knowledgeable people on the airplane say, no, this is what you do. You put the mask on yourself first. Because if you black out from lack of oxygen, you're not going to be able to help them, and then you're both going to perish. So I think there's an element of that type of wisdom here when the Lord says, watch out for yourselves. The Lord tells us biblically, because if there's darkness in us, how great is the darkness? If we have a plank in our own eye, how are we going to see clearly to remove a speck from our brother's eye? So we need to be watching out for ourselves first. Not only, but since he puts it here first, that's where it starts. Watch yourselves so that, more specifically, you may not lose what we have worked for. In other translations, you have worked for. It's a manuscript difference. 
There's manuscripts that say we, there's manuscripts that say you. Now, as we're told individually to watch ourselves, now we're given something specifically. So that you do not lose what was worked for, either by yourself or by others. Let's address that beyond the manuscripts. When you see things like this in scripture, because I know you guys study the word, we don't want to be deceived, we don't want to be fooled. Which is it? Is it us or you? The Lord records something in typical God fashion, or it's both. Well, how can that be? How can that be when scripture tells us we will each bear our own load? Well, ask yourself this. Are we part of one another? You know, I think just confessing something the Lord knows, but I don't think I've ever actually said this uh, before my brothers and sisters, when we think about the subject of rewards, which is mentioned here and has been mentioned recently in our Romans study, we shall all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, as we think about the teaching of Christ, that there's rewards mentioned various kinds, I think we all have a tendency to go and again, I don't think it's bad for us to go there first because we think about that. But I think we have a tendency to go there only to think, hey, if, you know, if, well, if I'm not abiding and I miss out on some of what the Lord has for me, I understand God's just. There's going to be something at the Bema seat that God doesn't want it to be. But how many times have we truly thought, it's like, you know what? I'm not an island. I'm a part of the body. How about the body of Christ completely will be diminished a little bit? It's just another aspect that I think brings us a little closer to Jesus here. We're told to watch for ourselves so we may not lose what we have worked for. But that word, what you have worked for, there's that understanding that the apostles, John in this case, knew exactly what was happening. He, as, well, a member of the body of Christ, not him, but Christ in him, was working towards the Lord's end. And it wouldn't be just the individual person that would lose out, but there's a, there's a sense that, well, Jesus would lose out on something. Not getting everything that he wanted. So, interesting as we look at that. And no matter how you slice that, it's very clear. We're supposed to watch so you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Now we need to take a moment and think back to what we looked in those first couple verses here. With that strong consolation, we're told, we're told that the truth that abides in us will be with us forever. That's non-negotiable. The Spirit will be with us. The Word will be with us. Neither one of those are going to fail. And we were told peace will be with us. But we're also told as much as the Lord is committed to this, as much as he has made available every means to accomplish his will, as much as he has committed himself to saying, I who have begun a good work and faithful to complete it, there is something in the here and now, brothers and sisters, to be watched out for. There is something that Jesus doesn't want. I'm going to suggest that we don't want either, even if we're willing to kind of to gamble and risk it here a little bit. Something that we're, we're warned about, this full reward. Something that goes beyond just us and it goes to the entire body of Christ. And I think by understanding this, is going to give us a little greater perspective as we think about what the Lord is doing with us. So we are told here to watch, verse 8, so we may not lose what we have worked for. Think about this. It is possible for a Christian to go backwards, to reach a level of maturity, to reach a level of understanding, a level of experience, and at least... In the here and now, the short term, between now and the Bema seat, to have reached a level of something that Jesus wants to give us, that Jesus wants to reward us for, and then have it go away. You know, I don't think we're told all the information that we might like, 
but I'm certain we're told everything we need to know. Be careful, that could happen. We're not told a great deal of how that happens, but we're told exclusively how to make sure that that doesn't happen. And that's always how the Lord gives us our focus. So he, he warned the church, as the Lord warns us, now, watch out for deceivers. People are going to tell you things. It could be something where you start out, as all believers start out, born again, full of the Spirit, a new reality. The Word is coming alive. You're full of all these wonderful truths and hungry for knowledge, and you start to study, and you find yourself in a church. Maybe you got yourself there. Maybe the Lord put you there. But, and then other people begin to teach you things that are maybe contrary. And maybe what you had is no... It happens so easily. The Lord says, watch out. He's given us the firm foundation that truth abides in us. You'll have that forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God and the Father. We have his word. We have his spirit. We have now his warning. There's going to be deceivers. And of them, we're told in verse 9, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. This might be the clear statement that we're looking for. Everyone who goes on ahead, New King James translates it as transgress. The meaning is the same. Transgress and sin are often used synonymously. Transgression is more of a, a specific aspect of sinning. I always think of it this way. Uh, transgression is crossing a known boundary. It's like going up to someone's property where there's a fence and clearly posted on that fence says private property, no trespassing, written in English, the language you understand, right? You see it, you know it, and you willingly choose to go beyond. That's the specific type of sin called a transgression described here in this translation. Everyone who goes on ahead on ahead, I think that's also key as we look at it. That's the most literal translation, goes on ahead. But it's leaving an established line of demarcation, if you will. Okay? So it said everyone who does that, and, and it's an act of the will in this case. They know where the edge is, they know where the boundary is, and they leave it anyway. Well, here's one thing that you know about that person. They do not have God. Okay? Pretty simple. Now you're thinking, wait a minute, this was written to the church. Think back to 1 John. We're told, and this is going to come up in, in very clearly in just a few moments, uh, this is our victory, right? Our faith has overcome the world. He who is born of God does not sin, we're told in 1 John actually okay so as a believer if you know what God says and you choose to go on ahead or cross over the boundary that's not what's identified as the spirit the new creation he can't do that he won't do that that's you in the flesh okay your flesh does not have God so it makes it really clear everybody who is not a believer well that's true of them by default so for Christians, everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. There's a fail-safe built in there. Brothers and sisters, I want to emphasis, emphasize this because it's the emphasis that the Lord has given me. If there's something so clearly that we're warned about as a church, a church in difficult times, of, hey, the, the teaching of Christ, what's the simplest way we can get to the root of any action in the church? Is this what Jesus taught us about this? Or is this what, well, this guy said? Or these people said? Oh, it sounds so convincing. But we're told that many deceivers will go out. The church has fallen for this hook, line, and sinker. We're told earlier in 1 John, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, right? In Isaiah, the Old Testament, we're told to the law and the testimony, another reference to the word of God. If we do not speak according to those words, the word of God, the teaching of Christ, there is no light in us. There's no truth in us. We're not of God. 
it is so easy and so common in our experience for us to be involved in something that has nothing to do with what the Lord has told us to do. And I think we see hints of that all the way back to some. I'm rejoicing in some. Wait, no, I think it would be better if we got more. Wait a minute. Maybe I've gone ahead of the Lord here. And that's a key aspect of this too. I've left what the Lord has said. I've left the Lord. He's back there waiting. I'm now going out there on my own, a position that I'll have to repent of, come back to where he is at. Brother and I were speaking earlier this evening of the clear example that's given to us in the word of God in the Old Testament. Israel, the teachings, right? It was so simple for them going through difficult times. Let's call it the desert. You remember how they knew it was time to move? Yeah, the very presence of God, a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, lifted up over the tabernacle and started to move. It's God saying, I'm moving now, you're moving with me. And how did they know it was time to stop? He stopped. They didn't go on ahead. They didn't transfer. As long as they did that, well, things were good. Be clear example. That's how it works for us. Hey, make no mistake, the Lord tests us. We all know intellectually the, the promises, right? The teaching of Christ as we think about this. Oh, we hang it on the walls here. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. In all our ways acknowledge him and he shall direct our path. That we know it experientially, but how many of us know? Okay, Father, here's the situation. I don't know what to do. I know what I want to do. I know how you want me to, how I want you to answer, but Lord, I need your direction. And then we never wait. We never give him the opportunity, the one whose timing is perfect and different than ours, the one who's working all things together, and we go on ahead. The pillar is still back there. But we're out wandering like sheep without a shepherd, if you will, somewhere in there. That's an example of transgression. And many people are out there teaching that very thing. Oh, God can't steer a parked car. Get moving and the Lord will turn you. That's not how Jesus did it. And the thing about Jesus is that's still not how Jesus does it. He hasn't changed. And that's the teaching of Christ. How many times do we find a reference to wait on the Lord in connection with God's promises of blessing? It's probably one of the hardest things for us to accept as his children, to understand first and then to trust that his timing is just different than ours. What if? God makes a promise to you that he's going to do great and mighty things and more time goes by than you're comfortable with. The temptation is to go on ahead, which is transgression, which is sin. Can you think of any clear biblical example? I'll give you a hint. It was called uh, the father of the faithful. Abraham. Abraham was old. He was already beyond his resources. He was... Well, he was wanting what everyone in his culture wanted. He was wanting an heir. He had no children. God promised that he would make his descendants more numerous than the stars in the sky or the sands of the seashore. And he told them. He just said it very simply. And then time went by. Years went by. Decade rolls by. And finally, well, you know what? The missus had a good idea. Here's what you do. You know, she wasn't old enough to have children, so you just take my young maidservant, and the phrase, they made an Ishmael, comes to represent they took action in the flesh that caused them difficulties the rest of their life. Why? Because they just didn't wait. They thought that, well, God was limited by the same limitations they were. But he's not like us. So please, brothers and sisters, take, take this clearly to mind as the Lord warns us. Watch yourself so that you may not lose what we have worked for, what you've worked for and the others who have worked for the Lord and the Lord has worked through have worked for it, but may win a full reward. Everyone, verse 9, who goes on ahead does not abide in the teaching of Christ, does not have God. It's, it's just 
that simple. It's got to be that simple. If, if we don't come to agreement with that, we're going to explain away what's coming up here in just a couple of verses. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Remember when Jesus said that if anyone serves him, the Father would honor, the Father would come and make their home together with that person? Hey, it's that abiding relationship with the Lord. You will have the Father and the Son. Now, does everybody teach that? Does everybody say, you know what? Just like it was at the beginning is God's plan, we need to, well, we need to be guided as much by the Spirit today as the church was in the book of Acts. They didn't go where he wasn't leading. They didn't go until he was telling them to go. They stopped when he said to stop. That's really a New Testament example of the Old Testament illustration of the pillar of smoke by day and flame by night. That was the church at its best, and that is what the Lord is laboring at. Many teach differently. So what do you do? What do you do when somebody has this different teaching? Well, here's what the Lord says. Let me stage it this way. Is this your approach or is this? Well, I know that's what the Lord says, but I wouldn't do that. Well, let's look at it. Verse 10. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, so round about the teachings of Christ, round about anyone who goes on ahead without the Lord, clearly one of them is, well, someone who would deny that Jesus was physical flesh and blood, God in human flesh. That's an example, but it extends beyond that. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. Now, customarily, the church at the beginning, right? As we saw, again, Romans, churches met in houses. They met other places, too. But the church at the beginning, man, it was just like walking with Jesus and the disciples. They had all things in common, Kind of thing, and if you're a brother and sister, you need a place to stay, and you know the Lord has given me this one. You know my house is your house, kind of thing. That's how it was. That's how well how it still is in, in abiding churches. So it would have been possible, and historians tell us it was a practice where deceivers would come and they would take advantage of Christian hospitality. The Lord says, if someone comes to you and they're different, they don't have the teaching of Christ, right? do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. Right? Doesn't this smack a little bit of what we talked about in Romans? Avoid them. And I took care to look at many scriptures and teaching. The Lord still means what he says. But yet we live in a time where there are people saying, oh, no, no, it's so different. The very basis of the what's described as the end times apostasy is we will unite over what we have in common. And if we have differences, we'll overlook those things that we might all just come together. But the truth is, the scriptural truth, the truth of the light of God's word, the early church had no such view on religious tolerance. Now, it's helpful and I think necessary to understand a little bit more fully uh, of what the Lord teaches us. If you're a brother or sister and a brother or sister comes and they're, they're off from what the teaching of Christ is, hey, that's an opportunity to, well, to correct them, show them. That's the first step, right? What we're talking about to the point of avoiding here is full-on rebels, not the uninformed or, or those who have made a misstep because we all do that and we're all uninformed until we are informed. It's the person who knows what God says, who knows what God wants. It's written in his word and says, yeah, but I'm going to do this. God isn't going there, but I'm going on ahead. And often it seems so right. Yeah, I know. It's just like, oh, there's not many who are saved. No, we've got to get the gospel out to everybody. Let's just stop. We've got to get this person saved. We've got to well, wait a minute, is that the Lord of the harvest sending you? Or is that you taking some of what you understand cognitively, Saito, and saying, 
This is what I'm going to do. Wait here, Lord. I'm going to bring in the... Oh, I've gone on ahead. Satan knows how to deceive the church. He will use seemingly good things in a way that seems right to us, but will be different from what the Lord says. And he has his ministers. First John wrote us in detail, told us in detail about them. Many have gone out. These are antichrists. They're opposed to Christ. The prefix anti, as was used here, also has another meaning. It's not just opposed, but it also means in place of. They present themselves as his workers. The church was warned in 2 Corinthians that Satan himself disguises himself as an angel of light. It's no small wonder if his ministers do the same thing. So the church is still being warned. Verse 10, if anyone, not someone, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. You know, in the early church, this would have been like breaking bread, showing us we don't even eat with such a person in a religious context. Why? Here comes the Lord's perspective. I don't think this is taught any place at any time except when a church does a Bible study in 2 John, verse 11. And I can count on the fingers of no hands that I've ever seen this point emphasized. So let's take a look at it since the Lord has kind of brought it to the forefront of my attention and since it's in his word. 2 John, verse 11, we're told, if we choose to go on ahead, we know what God says. I know, you know, it's like, well, and how do you think about this? There you are, and oh, you're, you're maybe at the door, it's late at night, and there comes a teacher, and they're a, well, they're a false teacher, and you know it, and you've corrected them, and okay, so I know I, because I love the Lord, and I love you, it's not helpful, I'm not going to let you in. No, that's not the only way it means. What about family dinners? You know, when you're there, and they don't agree, but you've taken the word, and they just won't have anything to do. No, I'll still eat with you, but I'm not going to have anything to do with this, and I'm naming the name of Christ. See, now it gets a little more difficult, doesn't it? These are the sticky wickets, because we're all subject to this stuff. Man, actually separate from someone after you've shown them the truth, after it's been clear, and after they've clearly rejected it and still named the name of Christ? Find a scripture that tells us not to in context. I said Sunday we would extend this a little bit into 2 John. If the church isn't first pure, if the church does not remain uncompromised, it's not in a position where it's going to help others. Satan certainly knows this. He doesn't know it as well as the Lord. But when the Lord says, watch yourself, when the Lord says, keep yourself pure, I liken it to the person who is seeking to help a drowning person. If you're not in a position on stable ground or a boat, if you're not in a good place that you can bring them to, how are you going to be of any help when you're as lost as they are? It is the essence of this that the Lord says, don't, don't greet them. Don't have anything to do with them. What fellowship does light have with darkness? Come out from among them. God gives a promise. I will receive you. I'll be a father to you. But if you choose to go beyond, if you choose to look at the multitude of references and all the different ways that he explains it, and all the many times in Scripture that God's plan for his nation, Israel, went sideways when they intermingled with the practices of the world, well, the Lord would say, I think this. Whoever greets him, whoever does that, whoever has that fellowship, takes part in his wicked works. Now, that's how the Lord sees it. You know, we, we've looked at some very, very serious things. Remember, just very recently, sin leading to death? God described that in 1 John, and we understand he's talking to, well, he's talking to believers He's talking to believers who are out and out walking in the flesh. We're talking to rebels. We're not talking to the uninformed. We're not 
talking. We're talking to someone who knows the truth, knows what God says, is resisting all correction, and then God, at a time of his choosing, in discipline and love, will call that one home. How do you think that happens? Well, I know God says this, but I think we've made an improvement. I'm going to just go beyond here. Well, God says, if you do these things, whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Verse 12. The application will continue here a little bit. The Spirit of God, through our brother John, writes to the church, and his Spirit says to us, Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. Now, there's a lot there. If we think about the technology of the day, well, paper and ink would have been about as high tech as it gets as far as carrying a communication. We kind of think, wow, what if John would have had the internet and Zoom? cell phone. He could have communicated. That would have been preferable. No, I think there's something very clear there. Whatever the medium is, and it's not bad, obviously, the word of God traveled. But he's relaying a very important truth. The Lord says through our brother, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face. So right there, there's some kind of a reference. Maybe it's just a a personal expression. Hey, a a preference. Well, you know, this is getting it done, but I'd rather do it this way. I think we've all experienced that. Man, you text somebody and maybe you're, you're really efficient so you don't use many words and you think, okay, I'm being concise. And the other person interprets it as being rude. You know, it's like, I don't know how that was written. Well, you meant that, oh no, this is just so hard. I'm, I'd rather not do that. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think he's saying there is, well, a desire to be with you in person. But even then, you might think, well, that's subject. John might just still prefer being there. But look at this. We're given more information. I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. What the Lord is saying through John is, here's the thing. It's not always possible when his servants could be together. A time of persecution. John was exiled on Patmos. We're not sure when or where he wrote this letter for it or the circumstances. But given an opportunity, there's going to be the fullness of joy when the church is actually the church. And that by definition, is an assembly of the called out ones or the elect as this letter starts out. When the Lord uses this word so that our joy may be complete, well, it, it's, a, it's a neat word to use there because the uh, implication is if it isn't this, there's a void. <laughs> there's something missing in this. And I would just like to suggest to you, brothers and sisters, that, hey, there are times, perhaps, when, you know, you're halfway across the country. I'm in this state, and you're in that state, and I would rather be there face-to-face, but the Lord's got me here, he's got you there, these are these circumstances. And praise God for pen and ink. Praise God for Zoom. Praise God for recorded teachings that you can still participate Praise God for 2 John. But let me ask you this. If you were given a choice, hypothetically speaking, you could read 2 John, or you could sit down with John and ask him about some of these things. John, what do you mean about rejoicing with some? And you were how strong did you mean to make it there when you said about don't receive them into your house? Which would be better? Which would maybe fill what you're perceiving as a void? Now, in all truth, we sit down with the Lord Jesus as we look to his spirit, and we can have total confirmation. 
But how about prayer requests with brothers and sisters? Hey, she or he is going through a thing. I got some of the details. I got enough to pray when I know the Lord leads, but I want to know, man. They're going through something. I'm going through something. We're connected. How did that work out? Something good happened. I want to hear about it. Something bad's happening, and I don't want to presume so I can pray. What's going on? When we're face to face, we all know and we all say that the Lord says when two or more are gathered together in his name, his purpose that he is there. That's what makes it special. Anything less than that. We're lacking. There's a void. So maybe to make an application. Praise God for pen and ink. Praise God for recorded teachings. Praise God for Zoom when we can't be together. But what about, ah, I'm just not feeling it tonight. Or, you know what? And I've heard this so much. I've not heard this from, from anyone in our church lately, so don't, don't take this the wrong way, brothers or sisters. But maybe somebody's, watching on a recording, or maybe you've heard this before. Oh, I just, I get my church on the internet. I listen to this, you know, Joe Huckster Bible teacher kind of thing, or maybe he's a good one, and that's church. Well, it might be a good teacher, and it might be a great teaching, and I hope it is, but that is not church. Church is face-to-face, -face, not face-to-screen. It's not face-to-paper. Lord's definition, it's face-to-face. That's where the fullness of joy is. Thus saith the Lord. That's, we can know, you know what? You can know that intellectually. And I think you can just read that and get it, but you will never know that experientially until you trust by faith. You know what, Lord? You said this. There's more to this. I'm going to do that. So your joy may be complete. Verse 13 says, The children of your elect sister greet you. Other people in the church, it's a lot like, the ending of Romans. Everybody is there because the church is that compilation of those called out in the Lord. The body is one body but many parts. You know, the body knows when there's a piece missing. In this case, they send their greetings. So let me kind of close up, recap, and further apply with this. Brothers and sisters online present, convinced as seeking the Lord at this season, as so I was like, Father, how do you want us to spend this last Wednesday night? And overall, whether it's tonight, whether it's tomorrow night, if you're with us, whether it's Sunday morning as we look at these things too, I believe the Lord is doing something very pronounced. We're not in First John by happenstance any more than we're here Second John. We, well. We're continuing in the doctrines of Christ. And I want to just kind of re-emphasize what we saw in 1 John. We saw that God's plan is for us to experience his realities, but it begins with us knowing them intellectually. Then you trust by faith, and he makes it real. Does that sound like a summary statement of something that we've heard kind of not too long ago, like the beginning of this year, as the Lord directed us to go through foundational spiritual growth truths, we reckon the Lord makes real. God said this, I trust him by faith, the Holy Spirit works through it, and now I have the experience, now I've waited on the Lord in accordance with his instruction, and now I see that he's working if I don't go ahead. That's how we started out this year. Hey, and the Lord is saying, don't go ahead of me on this. Don't lose any of these things. These spiritual growth truths, they're the foundation, but I have more to add on to them. If you depart from this, we'll be like those who go ahead. We run the risk of being deceived. We'll hear from others. But what the Lord has done is necessary for what the Lord is going to be doing. I will share in more depth, but I believe personally the Lord has said of us that he's going to be building his church in very difficult times. The Lord who has chosen this time and place has given us the necessary means, given us everything available, and now has taken the time to make it very clear. And maybe on this evening, 
as we end up this year and as we stand on the threshold of another one, we need to contemplate these things. As the Lord continues to refine his work in us, as he makes us more like him, he'll make us less like the world. There will be further separation. We pray and hope that the Lord uses us fully and maybe even uses us to add more to his kingdom. But one thing we know for sure, even as we were told in 1 John, that if we ask anything in his name, he hears us. And we have what he asks. Think about what we've been praying over and over. Lord, make us the church you want us to be. Lord, make us the elect lady of Second John. Make us the faithful church of Philadelphia, a little strength, kept his word, have not denied his name. Make us like you taught us, you chose us in Romans to be conformed into your image. Lord, make us to be well-pleasing to you in whom you delight. All these things that are true of Christ, we are, in a sense, asking the Lord. And I'm convinced, brothers and sisters, that the Lord has committed himself to these things. May the Lord give us wisdom and understanding. Let's go ahead and uh, close out with prayer. Father, we thank you. Lord, for this time, we thank you for the word. We asked you at the beginning, by your spirit, that you would take this short little letter, Lord, that you would cause us to understand, to apply it to our lives, by your spirit, Lord, that you would teach us all that you desire us to know. Father, there's so much there. There's encouragement, there's warning, there's application, all the things, Father, that you do in your faithfulness. So we pray at the end like we pray at the beginning. Father, we're asking you to have your perfect way, and we're thanking you in faith. And Lord, may I just add tonight, in lieu of some of the examples in the teaching, may we be the people who are willing to wait for you, Lord, as we wait upon you and not go on ahead. And Father, I would like to especially pray for any brothers and sisters who have gone on ahead in any church, Lord, anywhere. And there seems to be so many now, even as there were then, and you promised there would be. But Lord, we know that repentance and reconciliation is always available as long as we're here. Lord, we know it's your heart's desire. So might we honor you by praying first for ourselves because you told us to watch for ourselves and ask, Lord, is there any way where we may have transgressed? We may have heard the things that you said and we may have been like the example of Israel when they're not pleasing, where they didn't wait, they didn't trust, they went beyond. Lord, might we agree with the psalmist when he asked if, try me and know me, Lord, if there be any wicked way in me, Lord, that you would reveal it, that we would acknowledge it, Lord, and we would enjoy restored and unbroken fellowship. Do we pray this for ourselves? We pray for our brothers and sisters, Lord. Perhaps as you've examined us, we may see more clearly to help others, and we ask to be used that way. Father, I pray that you do such a work in us that other churches might see you and your faithfulness. We certainly pray that unbelievers in a very hopeless world, Lord, would see the hope that we have in you because it's practiced here and it's practiced in our homes, it's practiced in our marriages, it's practiced in our families, in our workplaces, Lord. And your peace goes with us wherever we go as we abide in you. Lord, that the experience of your truth is made more and more manifest to your glory. Father, I would like to especially lift up any brothers and sisters. It was prayed before we even began fellowship, Lord, that if anyone was heavily burdened this evening, Lord, that those burdens would not be obscuring their view of you, 
Lord Jesus, you yourself said that we're to take your yoke upon us. Your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. You rebuked the religious hypocrites of the day, Lord, who bound heavy burdens and didn't lift a finger. Father, I'm just moved to pray to, to encourage anyone that if there's any situation, Lord, that you alone are the hope, you have the answer. You will guide them if they will seek you and trust you to what, Lord, you want them to know to where the good way is that they may walk in it and find rest for their souls. So I pray, Lord, for anyone listening tonight that we come to you, believer or unbeliever. We come to you on your terms. Father, we're found by you. We're found in you. And that your life is found in us. Father, have your way, we pray, giving thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and close out the recordings.